Hello everyone, welcome to Tabito Stories. And today we have our guest, Ted. He's an artist and his artwork is, you know, like very creative, very, you know, beautiful when you see it. And it makes you think a lot about what he's creating because, you know, he's making something that I had never seen before. So yeah, he's going to be our guest and he's going to tell us about what he's creating, his story. And yeah, welcome Ted. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Where would you like me to start? Well, can you tell us about yourself? Where, where... Your story? <clears throat> sure. Uh, my story, it's long and convoluted. I got into the printing industry at age 15. Um, I got a job at Xerox. My brother got me a job. It was more or less to keep me out of trouble because I was a punk. And um, I stayed with Xerox for about seven years. And <clears throat> in my mid to early 20s, I moved to Florida. And in my late 20s, after about 12 years in the printing industry, I quit my day job eventually. I uh, quit my day job in 99 to pursue a musical career. I was a guitar, I am a guitarist, a singer, and I played harmonica. Um, and I had done that for 20 years in Florida. And Obviously, I'm leaving out details here and there, and we can fill in the blanks as, as we need to. And I just got burnt out doing that. And about 2014, I, I had already been exposed to the work of a guy named Brian Detmer. Uh, Brian Detmer, D-E-T-T-M-E-R. If you like my work, you might, you, I would highly recommend, even if you don't like my work, I would highly recommend checking out Brian's work. He is not the very first book sculptor, but he is certainly a pioneer in the field. And everyone that I know who's encountered his work is blown away. So I was very inspired by his work and having a passion for books and having spent so many years in the printing industry and working with paper, I started thinking about what could I do with books without duplicating, without copying Brian's work. And I'd start, started getting burnt out as a, as a full-time musician in Florida. I was working a lot. I started getting burnt out probably well before 2010. Around 2014, I actually got on my knees and, and said a bunch of prayers and gave thanks for the gifts that I, I've always known that I've had. You know, the way, I, one of the first things I said today was I've always been an artist. I've been comfortable in a lot of creative fields. I've always been able to draw. I've, I was, am a singer songwriter. So I'm, I can write decent, despite this, I'm pretty verbally fluent. I can play with words quite a bit and I can compose music and I can draw and I can paint. And I always found innovative solutions to problems. I could always create and I always knew that, well, if I couldn't play guitar anymore, I couldn't sing anymore, I would find another creative out outlet. So I was giving thanks for my creative gifts, which to me were evident. And I, I, I try to say this humbly, you know, um, they're not mine. I don't generate the ideas. They arrive, but I'm sort of a willing vessel. You know, I, I, I feel like the identity has been printed on me as an artist and I put up my antenna and say, I'm ready to receive ideas. And with that attitude, they arrive. And I notice that if I don't honor the idea, if I don't take action with the idea, the ideas stop arriving. So I, when ideas arrive, I either jot down the idea or I get to work with it right away. And um, so anyway, this prayer was of gratitude and it was a prayer of asking for direction because I was doing my best to honor my gifts, but what I was dealing with 
what I was doing wasn't working. It was, it was painful. It was no longer rewarding um, in a variety of ways. I was not living to a potential that I knew that I could at least start to aim toward. And after, during, during the prayer, I made an agreement saying, I will follow whatever crazy lead I'm being called, I feel that I'm being called to do, no matter how crazy. And it was the middle of the day, I was depressed. I went back to bed because I had nothing going on that day. Again, I was a full-time musician, so I didn't have a day job. And as I'm lying in bed, Brian Detmer's work comes to mind. And I'm laying there thinking about what could I do what could I bring to book sculpting that wouldn't be duplicating Brian's work? And eventually, I don't want to say a voice, but, but the notion arrived in my consciousness, stop dreaming and start cutting. I, had, I have a massive library of my own books that I love reading. And I had a bunch of books that I was ready to donate. There was no personal value. And I actually brought them to a, a used bookstore and they said, we can't use these, there's no market value. So I just had these books and I just basically took an X-Acto knife and I just started cutting. And it wasn't long before I realized there's far more that can be done with this art form than, than has yet been explored. I was also familiar with um, a gentleman named Guy Laramie. It's G-U-I, it's Guy, but pronounced Guy because he's French Canadian, uh, Guy Laramie. And he actually takes a sandblaster to books. He'll glue a bunch of books together and then put a sandblaster to them. And the end result is really remarkable. Different tool, different result. Um, so I was just thinking, you know, these, and I was familiar with book sculpt, sculptors. I, was, I would Google book sculpture and I'd see a lot of work, but those were the two who, their work was of a quality that I would aspire to. And, Like I said, I was sort of committed to bringing something new to the art form. So I spent actually a few years with all of my free time putting a blade to books. And I love books. These are books that really had no market value. They, early on, they were like dated psychology books, you know, books that um, the theories were old and the, the, the science was the current science had replaced the relevant information. So they were basically obsolete information. So um, rather than just throw them in the trash or the recycling bin, I started cutting them. And like I said, um, you know, the first experiments were kind of like, I want to make it look like a cave with stalactites and stalagmites and um, really three-dimensional, like something you can move into, you know, a book is flat, but it has depth but you don't see the depth when the book is closed. And basically I spent a while cutting books, really trying to find my voice. And one day I was cutting a book and I remember thinking, I can't believe I'm still doing this. Why am I doing this? And of course the response inside is, was we agreed, we, we made a vow that we would follow this call wherever it led and not give up before something worthwhile emerged. And as I was cutting this book, it got to a point where I had to clean up the area and move out of the way. And at one point when I, when I picked up the book, the book sort of collapsed. I'm trying to demonstrate, you know, the book is flat and I'm working it, working it. And when I picked it up, it collapsed. And when I picked it up, I don't, know, I don't know if the camera can actually pick it up, but the book bent like this and the three dimensionality, the depth of it revealed itself to me. And that's when I knew that I was onto something. You know, it was kind of like back when I was writing songs and a great hook, a great lyric would arrive. It was kind of like, thank you. You know, it was, it was, it was revealed to me. It wasn't 
of my doing. It was I was a willing I was willing to do do the work with no attachment to the result. And now that I know what the result is, it's a lot easier to just get started and keep keep working. Um, so then I had just once I had that book done, it was really a matter of okay, what book is next? And early on, it was soft cover, you know, paperback books, aiming for a lot of color, looking for books that had a lot of color and interesting imagery. And uh, when I'm working, it's kind of like a collaboration with, you know, the publisher publishes the book. There are designers who design the book and they have no idea that I'm out there, you know, planning to cut them up. So it's a collaboration with the book as it exists and me finding, again, I start with the book that's interesting and then I, I start cutting it. And as I'm cutting, I keep what I find interesting and I remove what seems can be removed, disposed of. Um, and I actually have all of the fragments of every all the books that I've cut I may do collage one day. I may donate, donate it to collage makers. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them, but uh, I have all of the, I haven't wasted anything. So anyway, that's a little bit. Yeah. And I really like your story and how you actually found out uh, about the books and how, you know, when it fell, you were like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Now I can create something out of this because you were able to see, you know, you had the idea about, what you were creating, you had like the idea and you were like executing it, you were doing it often. And then all of a sudden by mistake, you know, by, you know, reasons of something, it just fell in the ground and then you're able to see it. And then, you know, it just opened your mind. And what was the most difficult thing that you faced when you were cutting it, when you were, you know, beginning? Early on? Yeah. That the results were very slow. Before I saw any results, it was a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I have a certain level of perfectionism that I'm trying not to be too attached to. Um, I, I've surrendered perfectionism a lot. But like a lot of people, you know, it, it wasn't easy to just to play the fool. And um, there was a lot of feeling foolish. There was a lot of un discomfort. Um, and there was, like I said, the one book that really revealed itself to me as worthwhile that, that yes, this pursuit has been worth these years of exploration, even though they bore some fruit, but not a lot. Then this one that, that, like I said, it just, it just revealed itself to me as something beyond what I've experienced before. Um, and as I showed it to others, like you said, I've never seen anything like it. Um, the hardest thing was getting to that point, you know, because I cut one page at a time and getting started, it can, I can spend an hour on the first page just deciding on the composition, the shape of, of the cut. And now I know that it's worthwhile. Back then, it was faith. It was. It was. This might not. This might not turn out how. I don't know how this will turn out, but I have to trust that I'm being led to this, and the end result is going to be worthwhile one way or another. I just didn't know how worthwhile it actually would be. Yeah, it does make sense. And uh, uh, when you when you're putting the book, like. Uh, you know, many of those books, I know you have read some of you have read some of them. Have you ever thought about, you know, like creating like, you know, you have the book, right? So you read a book and the book is about, you know, human anatomy, you know, the, the human, you know, the human body. And then, you know, like for example, there's a story about something like that. And then you you grab the book, like did you ever went with the intention of, okay, I'm gonna try to replicate the story of this book in, in, you know, like in modeling it? I don't work thematically. I don't, I don't generally have an aim 
because I don't know what the end result is going to be. You know, it's impossible to compose these things. You know, the composition in a sense already exists. Um, it's not like Michelangelo with a target of pulling David out of a stone. Um, it's more like what is going to reveal itself as I'm working. Now, there have been a few books that I, I like the idea of not telling you what the book me might mean. You know, what do you get out of it? That's far more interesting to me. I'm excavating. I'm, it's almost archaeology. And I'm kind of quoting Brian Detmer there, but <laughs> we're working in the same form. We, you know, I understand what he means by that. Um, now, there have been books where, say, a, a mythological theme has emerged frequently, you know, several a theme or two or three might emerge. A lot of the books that I've worked with are um, illustration source books. You know, it might be a book of, if you're looking for an artist to design your logo or to do artwork for your company, here is a collection of hundreds of artists and examples of their work. So I have these artist source books, these illustration showcases that uh, are so varied you know, a variety of illustrations. And ultimately what I do is if the image is interesting and it's near the blade where I'm cutting, I try to keep it in. If the image is interesting, but it's away from the border that I'm cutting, I really have to go out of my way to create an interesting cut to capture that and that's not always worthwhile because I look at the, the space of the book as real estate. You know, there's, there's, there's a footprint of the book that there's only so much imagery that can fit. So how can I maximize the real estate? How can I keep what's most interesting? I'll, I'll give you an example. I pulled out a couple books to share if, as the, the discussion goes. Now, this is a National Geographic, and the image of the person on the front was, you know, it's running down the middle of the cover. So I cut around, I don't know how well you can see it in this lighting and on this phone, um, but you can see that, that the image of the person is blocking a lot of the color behind it. And, and when you have, when one has you know, sees it in person, you can see, you can look inside and look around. Um, but this is all answering your question about a theme, right? Mm -hmm. um, generally uh, themes, I haven't found a book that matches the theme. If I'm working with a book, here's a good example. I have a book right here called um, Graph Wars. It's graffiti, it's Star Wars graffiti. And now it's two dimensional. I, it's still, I haven't set it and glued it. But you got Yoda here, you've got a stormtrooper behind him, you've got Darth Maul, you've got one of the guys from the Clone Wars, you got uh, Greedo. And they get lost in all of it, right? Um, but Yoda, where he is, is blocking, say, Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader on, an, on another page. Um, so, you know, very often I'll have to go back and rework it because a kind of interesting image that I keep early on is blocking a far more interesting image later. So I have to remove, you know, I have to go back and remove it and do, do rework those pages. But generally, you know, the books, if, if a publisher is saying, I want to publish a book based on Star Wars, the designer who, who you know, the, the, the artist wants to keep the most interesting part of the image toward the center of the page. Well, if all of the interesting images are on the center of the page, the most, the, in, the interesting image that I find first that I decide to keep is now going to cover and block all of the subsequent interesting images. So it's, it's hard to, 
If I buy a book on a theme, it's not going to work for that theme necessarily. If I work with these illustration showcase books, a theme might emerge, but sometimes there are interesting images that have my that capture my attention or my Im imagination that I don't want to remove from that book just because it doesn't fit the theme that I thought I was working with. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And uh, I, I like that. It's not, it's not like songwriting where I'm staying very specific to the aim of the song. It's, it's more like there's a lot of, I think of it a, a lot like life is complex and forgive me for interrupting you. Life is complex and there's no sense in denying it. There's no sense in dumbing things down. There's no sense. You know, people like to say things like keep it simple. Well, if it started simple, yes, you can keep it simple. But if it's not simple, you can't make it simple without consequences in reality. You know, we all pay consequences for shortcuts. Um, in a sense, that's part of what my message in my work is. It's like when you look at a book, you see a brick, but there's far more there. I'm not giving you something new. I'm revealing what, always, what has always been there in a new way. Oh, I see. That's uh, very interesting, the way of captivating people and their attention. And I like the way how, you know, you're doing it because you're doing it in a way that, um, like you say, is very complex. You're bringing the complexity and kind of like you have no expectation, like this is going to be what I'm going to be doing. This is specifically what, you know, like I know you have words in your books like they have like little words in it. This is the word that is going to be. And then you're crazily looking for that word and then you can't find it. And then you're stressed, you're like, man, like I can't find it. And then all of a sudden when you don't have that, all of a sudden you're just, you know, cutting the book and then you find something like peace. And it is exactly where you need it to be. And I think that's a really cool way of doing it. It's interesting you say that, you know, I've found that, and I'm, I'm not the only one, I'm sure. When people set an aim, and start pursuing a goal. You know, I'm not the first person to say this, you know, the universe seems to conspire to help you attain that goal. What appears to be coincidences start emerging in your life. And I find that that occurs a lot when I'm working, you know, it doesn't always happen, but the very often the image that shows up on the page is exactly where well, it, it composes itself. You know, there are, I, I, I did go to art school. Um, I'm somewhat trained as an artist. And, you know, there are trained artists. My, my art is somewhere between, it's more outsider art because I'm pioneering in ways I'm doing something that's never been done before. And there's no theory of it. And the color theory, you know, I can't stick to color theory because I'm working with whatever colors are in the book. The palette is so diverse that you're going to see, you know, 10 different greens and six different blues that don't harmonize, wouldn't harmonize well in a painting. But somehow they, for the most part, and I'm not saying every piece that I've done is a success in that way. But certainly if I was paint, you know, I couldn't paint something like this without getting paralyzed, making color choices if I had this much color to work with but yeah when you're talking about finding words when I get to a page that is mostly text or even a little bit of text I will look at it and and think be, be looking for uh, found poetry or or I'll take an interesting sentence and then or a paragraph and just corrupt it you know I'm um, now this one, and again, I'm not going to attach any meaning to it. Sometimes they're very funny. Sometimes they're not. But I'll show you this book. This is one of my most recent ones. I'm really pleased with it. It's a little larger than some of the books. Um, but here, I'm trying to see what you can see on the camera, are some words that I cut out. <clears throat> and I've, I've, I'll bring it close so you can see how I've edited it. I've cut words out of the middle of the sentence 
So I've redacted a bunch of words, but I've changed the meaning of the paragraph or the sentences. So it says, focus and achieve something crucial. Make an impression. Look, really look. See an extraordinary thing. It's hyp it is hypnotic and moving. It is emotional. I love this view. You know, and th that particular, those sentences were not there originally. They were there, but they had other words around it, making it, it means something else. But I like looking at these paragraphs and saying, how can I change the meaning? How can I make it interesting and plus visually interesting because it kind of looks like lace, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I see. So, and that wouldn't, though, I'm not saying it's profound or anything like that. It's just interesting and playful. And that wouldn't have been there if it wasn't near the margin where I was cutting. That wouldn't have stayed because if it was in the middle of the page, it would have been too much effort to capture it without blocking so much real estate behind it. I see that. Th thank you for this practice, by the way. This is my, the, my first time on a video interview. And, you know, I'm sort of stumbling through this stuff. PR is going to be a big, important part of my marketing mix. And... Thank you for the practice. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's nice having you here and it's getting to know what you're creating because it's, you know, like since I first saw it, like it was just amazing. And then, you know, like I was looking at your Instagram post and I see that they have little words. So that's something that, you know, I do art and I do it with newspaper. And the way how I'm doing it, kind of like, kind of like, you know, the way how it came to you, that's, that, that's the way how art came to me. And... As you are saying, you know, you're not looking for anything specifically because and you're, you don't give it a definition because you can give it a definition. It's very complex and everyone is going to interpret it their, you know, their own way. Sure. So you can attach yourself to the painting because you may see this today, but then tomorrow you're going to see it and you're going to see something completely different. There's an idea that if someone is working hard to deliver a message in their art, it's probably propaganda you know, and it won't be timeless. It, it might serve, it might speak to a, a, a certain time, but I'm not trying to, if I'm trying to get someone to think differently, if I'm trying to persuade anyone of anything, it's something like the world is more complex than you probably see it as. This is a book. You never saw a book like this before. I'm again, I'm not giving you something new. I'm revealing what was, um, but I'm not trying to influence your political decisions or your spiritual outlook or anything like that. Um, I think to some degree artists, we're, we're explorers, you know, and the, where creativity comes from is obviously a mystery, you know, ideas arrive. I mean, we can, call the mystery god or the muses or you know depend, whatever your perspective is clearly it's a consciousness that did not originate between my ears so i think to some degree the artist at least this is my approach i have to sort of surrender to the spot spot it's it's almost improv 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 improvisation i have to surrender to what's showing up in that moment. Um, if I have an idea that I think I'm deliberately trying to communicate, I sure don't want to corrupt the world that way. I don't want to try to influence anyone to see things my way because I'm probably wrong. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what you're saying, you know, it does make sense because, you know, when you are, when you're doing that, when you're, you know, trying to, let someone else see what you see, put them, let them see what you see, you know. In a way, it's, it's too heavy, it's too heavy, you know, to carry it around you because you're like trying to make someone see what you're creating or, you know, kind of like understand your message when in reality, everyone has different opinions, everyone has different ways of looking at things. So I think uh, I was looking at this guy last time that he was creating art through class and at the beginning, he would, you know, tell people to 
stand at a place and just you know be able to see that figure you know like three dimensionally because he was breaking the glass and then he was like but this does there, there is no meaning to it you know because you're actually telling people what to see instead of you know let them see what they have to see that's interesting that's a philosophical conversation that i'd like to explore more i don't know that i have a uh, final answer at this point i haven't come to some final conclusion about it because i think there are things that are worthwhile to talk about and and um i don't know that it doesn't mean anything um because it's going to mean something and i think there are dangerous meanings too you know i mean our world is you know there's so much um we're at each other's throats in so many ways you know say politically or whatever and that's because we've attached meaning um how could how could meaning diverge so much from person to person do you, do you know what i mean how could how could we be at each other's throats because of how invested we are in the meaning of fill in the blank? I won't say that all of my work has no meaning, but again, the overarching meaning or message seems to be something like, here's something that's always been there. See the trees for the forest. As you know, people always say, I couldn't see the forest for the trees. I couldn't see the big picture because of the individual things. Now I'm saying, well, you saw an individual thing and here's all these components that are inside there. Is there one big meaning, you know, for the whole thing, the overall composition or each component has a meaning. It's kind of like being ce cells in a greater organism, you know, and that's how I look at our place in the universe. It's like, we're all just an individual cell in a greater organism. We may or may not know that organisms aim. And if I'm a blood cell, who am I to tell you how to be a better brain cell? You know, if, if I'm a blood cell, how can I tell someone else how to be a good bone cell? It's like, I don't know. I don't know what your meaning ought to be. I play with ideas a lot. Forgive me. No, it's good. Uh, I see what you're saying. It's like, um, it's like thinking about companies. Like you see the big company like Apple but you don't know what's behind Apple. You don't know the people that is working in Apple. You sometimes you see the CEO, the, the person that is working at the top. And then you don't see the workers, the ones that are working, you know, like, you know, that, that are doing the, the other job, like the selling, the marketing, those stuff. It's kind of like that. How can you tell, you know, the CEO to do this when you do this? And, you know, your ideas can influence that, but, you know, you can make them see what you see. Well, we see what we're looking for and, and can I empty myself of preconceptions of what I think it should be, you know? They, okay. So this is the thing, you know, you've said, I've never seen it before. I've never seen anything like that. And, you know, the world is a rich place and it bugs me when people say I've seen it all. It's like, really, you've seen it all. You seriously, how old are you? You've seen it all. It's like, I want to, you know, when I'm breathing my final breaths, I want to understand that I haven't scratched the surface of what can be seen or understood. Um, and I love it when, you know, one of the things that invigorates a lot of people is they're always looking for something new, you know, this undying curiosity. And when people say things like that wasn't supposed to happen, it's like, well, who's doing the supposing? Um, who said that wasn't supposed to happen? Why, who, why, why, how are you so informed with these rules? Um, so that's kind of what I would like to shed some light on with my work. Um, a book's not supposed to look like that. Well, who said it? Obviously, it does look like that. But as an artist, it wouldn't look, it wouldn't look like that without me. And, you know, I'm not the originator of book sculpting. I'm pioneering my own fingerprint in it. You know, you can find a lot of book sculpture sculptors. If you Google book sculpture, you'll see a bunch of work in a certain style. If you Google book excavation, 
you'll see book sculptures in a more specific style. So mine, I, I call them book sculptures just because technically that's what they are, but it's the genre is emerging within the art world as book excavation. Uh, book sculptors, book sculptures are more like people who fold the words. If you, you'll see them, there's a lot of great artists who do stuff like that, but I'm interested in exploring what else can be done. So you've seen a lot of my, you've seen a lot of my work on Instagram. This is a different example where I disregarded the borders altogether. And rather than following the margins, I cut, call it an X form. And, you know, this is quite different than any, this is the first piece of its kind. I like, one thing that's fun, interesting about my work is almost each one of them are the first of its kind. Each one has a different approach or technique that I've introduced because I, I want to keep innovating. I want to, I, I don't want to get stuck in a formula. Um, the artists that I admire most are the ones who have continued to evolve, you know, where you can see a progression over time, you know, and say musically, you know, you can take an example like the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or Rush, you know, these are bands that had a sound at the very beginning that clearly changed over time they were adding new components if it was new technology or just new ideas and that's one thing that i'm really interested in also yeah and uh, when you were going up who was someone that influenced you to keep trying or to keep you know to to let your curiosity you know like just you know just try new things and see new things who was someone that show you that or who was someone that inspired you to to see those things well my first okay so this is interesting i think my first exposure to art was my father was a fan of norman rockwell um and there were a lot of rockwell reproductions around the house and books of norman rockwell's i i was thinking about this because i knew we'd have this chat and i was thinking about my early artistic influences my brother had a friend who used to come over and we would draw and I, when I watched others work, I could easily see, uh, I, I could take it in pretty easily. And he used to draw this, maybe I only saw it once, but it left an impact. And I used to draw it all the time where he would draw an eyeball and really exaggerate the, the eyelids, you know, the, the, the skin, the eyelids around the eye. And then he would draw another eye beside it as if it was a three quarter uh, profile. So it, it was just something really, it was a different perspective. I ha hadn't, I was very young. I would probably say seven years old. I hadn't seen a cartoon, a pro it was kind of a cartoonish, you know, because my brother's friend was maybe four years older than me. But it was just, wow, it's not clearly a profile or clearly a, a straight on shot. It was three quarters and it was the eyes sort of overlapping each other. And it became part of my signature, my fingerprint, making sketches as a kid for a, a while. And I just liked exploring what's unusual, what's different. There was a period where I was drawing the idea was a checkerboard, but rather than a grid, I was making the lines really crooked and skewed and, uh, you know, organic. And I would color in every other, it would be a checkerboard pattern, but it wouldn't be with squares. It would be random shapes. And it's interesting because now on Instagram, I see people doing that kind of thing all the time. I hadn't seen that before. It was just somehow inspired. Then in high school, when one of my peers saw that I was doing that type of work. She bought me an MC Escher book. Are you familiar with Escher? No. You need to look up Escher. Um, he, you, you, you must have seen some of his work. He was the guy who, mostly with pencil, would draw these geometric shapes, the interlocking geometric shapes. But, the, you know, he would take a hexagon, like a honeycomb, but then start turning them into bodies forms of one sort or another so that they became interlocking pattern of you know have you ever seen the picture of the waterfall where there's a zigzag tower 
where the waterfall comes down, but then the water zigzags back up the tower. I, I haven't seen it. M.C. Escher challenges the way one looks at the natural world. And he was a mathematician first, but just a genius, and a, a remarkable draftsman. In other words, he can paint or draw with precision, but he was doing things that were otherworldly. And he, I, I, I want to say he was in the early 20th century. So 1920s, 1930s, I could be wrong. He could have been earlier, but M.C. Escher, E-S-C-H-E-R, I just assume the whole world knows who he is. Um, and then of course, later on, it was Salvador Dali, who, who I trust you're familiar with him. Yeah. Yeah, um, obviously he was putting a spin on <laughs> reality itself. And once I saw his work when I was a teenager, I never drew anything the same again. So that was somehow like, uh, when Salvador the Lee came, that was you know where, you know, you everything you you were doing kind of like you know change, because it was so much different what he was creating, and I kind of see you know like looking hearing your story, and what you were saying, how you know that when you were seven years old, you know the the guy that did you know the the this eye that was you know like kind of like you could see it from different perspective these different angles kind of like that has kind of like shown through your art and the the even the the sketcher the what is it called? it's the you know the the chess table how the chess table and you were trying to like you know like bring it in a three-dimensional world kind of like all of those ideas you know all of a sudden just started popping up and then without even realizing when you when you when you gave the prayer you know like it came to you everything you wanted it just started you know like coming up and now you're doing this and are there any are, are, are there any art shows that you're doing to showcase your art yes uh thank you for asking i'm currently in um i i, I live in north georgia right now i left florida um, in March, April of, of 2019, um, I, I had saved up enough of a nest egg to decide that I'm going to leave my art career, I mean, my music career behind. I've had this, um, but I'm not performing. Um, anyway, I'm, I've moved to North Georgia with the aim of launching this career because I didn't have a body of work. I might have had a dozen pieces, but I knew I was onto something really new. So I set aside one to three years um, where I don't have to worry about generating income. But now I'm coming toward the end. I'm in my last year. I'm approaching my last year of that. It's like I have to be able to launch the career. So lately I've you know been doing that. I just entered a show here in LJ, Georgia. Uh, it was a juried show. I entered six pieces, all of them were accepted. And I'm honored to be able to say that I got a blue ribbon for best uh, three-dimensional work on one of my pieces there. Shortly thereafter, someone from Anne Marie Sculpture, they found me on Instagram and invited me to enter into their national juried show um, so I finished the application of that a week or two ago, and I was notified a few days ago that one of my pieces was accepted to that. So that show will be, and that is a specifically book art themed show. That show is going to be, it's, it's in Solomon's, Maryland, uh, about an hour south of DC. The show at Anne Marie Garden Henry Sculpture Garden is going to be from February 19th through September 26th, so seven months. I've got one piece of exception to that. I was invited. 
I, I entered for on their website, they've accepted about almost a hundred pieces of art from 80 some odd different artists. And looking at the style of the general style, if I had known what they were, if I had known which the taste uh, that would generally be selected, I would have entered different pieces, but you live and learn. Um, but I'm grateful to be a part of that. And since then um, opportunities are arising right and left. Um, but those are the two that are definitely on the books. I mean, one right now, the one here in Ella J, Georgia, which is North Georgia, will be going on really just till March 2nd. Um, and it's a juried show. So there's about 60 pieces of art and six of, six of them are mine. And then there, there will be other opportunities arriving too. I'm getting a lot of calls, which is great, but no other commitments. That, that's good to know that, you know, that your art is making it and when you set your time and your goal and your, your time basically to create, you know, it's working out and uh, the sacrifice that you made, you know, like living uh, music for, for this, you know, like being a musician for this and, you know, everything is just kind of like working for you, just the way it is working. And... It seems in a lot of ways, everything's sort of falling in my lap but mm -hmm. it's not free, you know, it's not effortless. I'm, do, I'm doing what I got to do to make it happen. Um, I worked my tail off to hone my style. And then I worked my tail off to build a body of work. Then I worked my tail off to do PR, you know, and I'm not done with the PR right now. It's, it's you know, it's winter. It's a little chillier in my studio here. My studio's in the basement. It's not the most comfortable place to work. So to some degree, I'm generating less work but doing the you know knocking on doors because that's a big part i think an, an aspiring artist needs to recognize that you know the idea the percentage that i learned is practical is 50 50 50 percent of the time generate work 50 percent of the time knock on doors to you know do pr you know do promo whatever it is to get your art to the market um, and I'm really, really green. I'm really new at this. Um, I, I'm grateful that my work is having such an impact. It's reaching a lot of people. But I, when people say things like, you know, you're flying high, it's like, I'm just on the runway. I'm just getting started. Um, there's a lot of knocking on doors. In my experience, it was very similar in, in, the, in, in music in Florida, you know, I knocked on a lot of doors and the doors that opened weren't always the ones that I knocked on, but because I was knocking on doors, they opened. Not every single one, but if I wasn't seeking opportunity, I wouldn't have recognized the opportunity when it arrived. You know, I, I told a friend the other day, I love the Thomas Edison quote. It's something like, people don't recognize opportunity because it shows up wearing overalls and looks like work. So, you know, the reward for hard work is more hard work. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, um, you see, you know, people, you see, you know, the, the success, you know, basically that success are little things that you were basically putting in the time in, like knocking on doors, knocking on doors and sometimes getting a no. And then when you get a yes, you're like, yes, I got it. And you feel good about it. And that's, you know, the little success that, that you get. And that's, you know, that it may, not, it may not look like a big thing, you know, because, you know, you're doing it and you see all the work you have done. You see that the times, you know, when you couldn't get something done and, you know, some, a door this didn't open to you. And then when that one opens to you, like, yes, I got it. But that one, you know, you have to work for it after you got it. That's, I, I, I'd like to speak to that a little bit too, because back in like 2017, I had a friend, a very wise business person, but not really in touch with artistic sensibilities, let's say. And he would say things like 2017 is going to be your year. And I'm like, I'm not ready to launch. Don't pressure me. 
works, but your work is so good. You got to get it out there. And it's like, I don't, I'm not ready, you know? And then 2018 is going to be your 2019 is going to be your, and I'm like, I don't fit your agenda. Don't try to fit me into your schedule. I mean, don't try to make me work your schedule. Um, and of course, knocking on doors, I'm speaking metaphorically. It's, it's, it's putting the effort out there to introduce myself. And yes, it's progressive, right? Because locally, it seems like a bunch of coincidences. Locally, I went to the gallery. It wasn't a good time to meet the manager, but I, I showed her some work. She said, wow, that's interesting. I'd love to hear more, but now is not a good time. Um, fortunately, I wasn't too much of a jerk that I, even though it was bad timing, she, she was open to seeing me and my work again. And so I came back and I said, how can I make it really easy for you to want me in your gallery? And she had, she pulled it out of the printer. She said, I just printed this for you. It's an application to our juried show. A week later, I entered the show. Another week later, I was accepted to the show. Now, granted, it's a small local gallery, but that was a victory, right? It was encouraging. It was like, heck yeah, I had to go beyond my comfort zone just to start doing, you know, I had to go around and measure all of my work. And I, all, another thing about my work is it's so new that I, I, there's a lot of engineering that had to go into it. Like here's a piece, this is just an example of a shadow box that I had designed and custom built. But I, it was my design in collaboration with a, with a woodworker friend of mine, but we had to come up with the design. Um, the book is kind of small, but as a piece of art, if I put the frame behind the shadow box, it's a bigger footprint on the wall. It's a bigger piece of art. It gives us more of a sense of value to the buyer. Now that some buyers want it, some buyers don't. So they have an option of getting a different shadow box, but I had to engineer the result of how, how am I going to get this through the mail onto your wall? Do you know what I mean? I had to engineer, how am I going to actually, I had to get, how am I going to get this three dimensional, then mount it, then ship it get it on your wall. So there were a lot of problems to solve along the way. It's the same thing with marketing. You know, I wasn't ready to aim for a national juried show a month ago, but because I won a local juried show and I learned how to fill out the paperwork properly, it made it that much easier and it gave me fuel, gave me fire to do something bigger. And even though it was more paperwork and even more work, measure the, you know, what are the dimensions of the work? How is it going to be shipped? How is it going to be displayed? What, how much does that show up for the end user? The end user needs to know, is this work ready to put on my wall? And when you're pioneering something brand new, those ideas, those factors aren't even on my horizon. They're not in, in my awareness. So I realize I'm rambling and I'm intertwining a bunch of different progressions at once. But uh, yeah, the little victories, you know, there were times when I showed my work to somebody and they said, I don't get it. And that actually derailed me. I, I didn't work for like a month or two because I was so discouraged by someone who I respected didn't understand my work. And I realized that why did I give him that power? Why did I, because Again, to some degree, it's faith. I know that my work is quality and most of the people who see it know that it's quality, but I had to learn also, you know, toughen your skin a little bit, you know, thicken your skin and understand that not everyone is going to receive what you're offering. I see what you're saying and there's surely a lot of work and I wanted to ask you about that, but you answered me the question and kind of like what you were doing because... I know that it just takes a lot of time. You got to go to the framer and they got to do that. And then you got to wait for like two months until you get the framing. And it just takes time. I mean, it basically, you know, probably one of your pieces probably takes six months to get the full process done and probably even longer to get that, that little, you know, you know, cutting and getting the design and the shape. 
And that's something that I, you know, like I respect and I admire because what you're creating is something that I, like I told you, I had never seen it. And when I saw it, I'm like, this is amazing. Like I, I really like what he's creating. And there is one piece that is very similar to Salvador Dali, right? That you created. Well, there's one, I have um, a piece that was a Dali book you know, and um, that one's sold. I don't have it here to show you, but I have the original, I have a copy of the original book. So I'm going to grab it here. Um, you know, I mean, it's a book. So this one only has, and I think this one's missing a page. This book was designed, uh, Taschen is a German publisher. I think they're German. Um, but Taschen Portfolio, it's like, here's 15 Dali pieces that you can put in a, uh, in a frame and put them on your wall. Well, I would rather give you one piece, far more interesting. So I started cutting it, but there's, since there's only 15 pages, I didn't have that much to cut. So then I took page one and it became page 16 and page two became page 17, et cetera, as I was cutting it, removing it. So the, it's the same book that I cut once before. It's different than all the other books because I was adding itself behind itself. So the end result of that book is about two inches, three inches thick. Uh, I did insert spacers between the pages to add to the depth of the book. But to answer your question, yes, I did a Dali book. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're going to conclude the show right now. We're going to about to end it. And it has been a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, can you tell us three things about yourself that we probably don't know about it that, that you would like to tell, you know, you well, before I do that, mm -hmm. before I do that, let me let everyone know that my name, my name is Ted Ray. W R A Y is my last name. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, um, preferably my artist page. So Ted Ray comma artist or shortcut for that is FB dot me slash Ted Ray arts. And my Instagram is just at Ted Ray artist. I'm also on Twitter, but I don't really use it. And you can find me on YouTube also. Three things that people don't know about me. Okay, here's one. Um, I was the youngest vested employee at Xerox. Like I said, I started my job at age 15 there. When I was 20, I was vested at Xerox. Um, that's, I don't think that has happened to anyone else. There are a lot of things that my, the art community won't know about me, but the, you know, Tampa Bay knows about me. Um, in 2002, I won Best of the Bay in the local newspaper there for Best Singer Songwriter. But I, don't, I shouldn't have said that because that's bragging. I didn't mean to do that. Um, three things that people don't know about me. I'm a huge fan of Game of Thrones still. I'm reading um, the second book yet again. Um, ultimately, I think I've, I've communicated it for the first time here and now with you. I want people to, if I have a message, I want it to be something like, you haven't seen it all. And even the things that you're familiar with, there's more to be explored there. That I think is the message of my work, but we've already gone into that. Uh, Gustavo, I appreciate you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. and. I mean, I appreciate your time and uh, coming to the podcast and sharing your story, sharing your artwork and what you're creating. And I will leave a link below so you know uh, my audience or anyone that is watching, they can check your artwork, they can, they can connect with you and they can see what you're doing because I think what you're doing is amazing. And like I told you, I've never seen this and kind of it blows my mind to see it, and to see that you, you created something out of nowhere. There was a book and you made something out of a book so yeah well i i didn't do it alone like i said you know brian detmer's work inspired me and i asked for guidance and i listened and um yeah and that's why that's why i mean listening is a big thing you gotta listen because you gotta see what someone else opinion or idea can help you in or knowledge in whatever they do can help you achieve whatever you want to achieve your goals your dreams or an aspiration 
Well, I like the idea that, you know, aim high, set a target, but realize that your course will change. You know, when you're setting a target, you don't necessarily know that's what I want because I'm pretty stupid. Um, but as I move toward the target, you know, I can course correct, you know, things change. I get more information. I find that this doesn't work so much, but this does. So you're, you're, the course can change, but moving forward, you know, aiming, aim high and do the work. And this is the conclusion of the video stories. And today we talk with Ted uh, Ray and yeah, I mean, let's get it and hope you guys have a good day and stay safe and stay blessed.